this episode, we'll be talking about stars, what they are, how they form, and how they change throughout their lifetimes. Let's begin. What exactly is a star? Well, a star is simply a massive ball of gas that creates its own energy. The especially important part of that definition is the creating its own energy. This is what distinguishes a star from, say, a large planet. Stars are the only objects in the universe that actually create energy. We're going to talk about how they do that shortly. Take a quick look at this video. This shows our sun. The sun, of course, is our star, the star that the Earth revolves around. It's about 93 million miles away from us. Just think about that for a moment. Imagine going outside on a hot summer day, barely being able to look into the sky because of the brightness of the sun, feeling it as it burns your skin. This is happening at a distance of 93 million miles, which gives you an idea of just how powerful, how much energy is being emitted by the sun. Also keep in mind that the sun is simply an average star. There are much bigger, brighter, hotter stars in our galaxy and in the rest of our universe. So how do stars actually create energy? Well, it's a fairly complex process. Essentially what happens is intense, intense heat and pressure inside the cores of stars causes light elements, light elements being things like hydrogen most commonly, to actually bombard each other and fuse together, forming heavier elements like helium. This process of fusing light objects into heavier ones is known as nuclear fusion. Just to give you an idea of how powerful nuclear fusion is, imagine for a moment a nuclear bomb. Now I'll start by saying that nuclear bombs do not use the process that occurs in the sun. They don't use fusion, they employ a slightly different process called fission. Regardless, imagine how powerful one nuclear bomb explosion is. Well, the sun, which remember is an average star, emits the equivalent of 100 billion of these explosions worth of energy every second. It's almost mind-boggling to think of that amount of heat and energy coming off of the sun, but that's what's happening. Let's take a quick look at a video which will explain nuclear fusion in a little bit more detail. Fusion occurs when atoms are smashed together at a high rate of speed and literally fused. To get this to happen, conditions have to be just right. For any interaction to happen, these two protons each has a positive electric charge and so they would repel each other. So you've got to get them close enough together. And to do that, it's got to be hot, which means the particles moving very fast, and dense enough that they, that they hit each other and they can get close enough together that they actually fuse. The core of the sun is the perfect cauldron for nuclear fusion. It's the hottest place in the solar system at a sweltering 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and it's also incredibly dense. It's so dense, it's 10 times the density of lead. And you would think at that density it should be a solid, but it's not because it's so hot that it remains a plasma. If you heat a gas to high enough temperatures, electrons fall off of the atoms and they float around in the soup. And so it has behavior that's different from what a gas would do. And so we have a different word for it, we call it plasma. To truly understand what goes on in the core of the sun, you have to find some way to imagine the almost unimaginable. In addition to studying the sun, I also play pool. And the sun is a place where there are billions of particles colliding and interacting with each other. And it's really not unlike a cosmic pool table on an unimaginable scale. It doesn't matter how hard you hit a ball. You would never hit it hard enough to actually fuse that ball together with another ball. But there's so much pressure and such high density at the core of the sun that the two objects impacting each other will actually fuse. In the sun, these objects are hydrogen atoms flung together by immense pressure to form helium atoms. In this fusion process, the resulting atom is slightly less massive than the ones that created it, 
the missing mass is given off as energy. Each second inside the sun, 600 million tons of hydrogen are fused into 595 million tons of helium. That 5 million tons of mass lost in the process is converted into energy equal to 1 billion 1 megaton hydrogen bombs. That's every second. When you look out into the cosmos, the process that gives you the highest return of energy for free is what goes on in the centers of stars like the sun. So let's review the fusion reactions that are occurring in the sun. We start with atoms of hydrogen, the most plentiful element in the universe. Under the temperature and density or pressure conditions in the core of the sun, these atoms are flying around at incredible speeds and they're bound to collide with each other. And when they do, fusion occurs. The two hydrogens fuse together to form helium and in the process releasing massive amounts of energy. This is where the sun gets its energy. Here's a simple explanation of fusion. Light elements plus other light elements yield heavier elements and energy. Now the reason I don't just simply say hydrogen plus hydrogen equals helium and energy is because it's not always hydrogen plus hydrogen. This is the first in many stages of fusion that occurs in stars. It all begins with hydrogen fusing to helium. But when stars are hot enough, the helium can actually fuse and that yields carbon. And if it's hot enough, the carbon will fuse to oxygen which could potentially fuse to neon, to silicon, and ultimately to the element iron. Now iron is the final stage in stellar fusion, and this is because temperatures just don't exist to fuse iron any further. The really neat thing about this idea here, however, is that all of the elements of the universe, all the elements that exist on Earth, actually formed within stars you can actually trace the carbon atoms in your body back to some high mass star that was burning brightly in the universe at some time in the past. So how do stars actually form? Well, again, it involves gravity. We begin with a cloud of dust and gas, which we call a nebula. The nebula, this cloud of dust and gas, will contract, causing it to heat up, and this is caused by gravity it essentially collapses upon itself. And when it reaches the right temperature, fusion will begin. And once we have fusion, we have a star. Let's take a look at this process. Nebulas house baby stars in every spiral arm of the galaxy. These regions are the nurseries for new stars. There are young stars in these regions, that are heating up gas clouds that surround them and making those gas clouds glow pink. Stars are made out of gas, basically, and our galaxy has gas. In fact, our galaxy, you can think of it as having an atmosphere of gas and dust that surrounds all of the stars that we see in the disk. And it's from this gas that new stars are born. By observing nebulas at different stages in their evolution, the story of a star's birth begins to emerge. It all starts inside a cold, dark cloud of dust and hydrogen gas, where a quiet tug of war begins. The cloud wants to dissipate, like smoke in the air, but gravity wants to pull it together. They're in a kind of balance between gravity pulling in and gas pressure pushing back out. Gravity wins, and the material crunches down into a disk that is the beginning of becoming a star. As gravity pulls more and more gas towards the center of the disk, it gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter. Until finally, at 18 million degrees, a miraculous transformation takes place. Hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium, and with a burst of nuclear energy, a star begins to shine. These stars eventually get their nuclear fires going in the core, and when they do, they heat up, 
they uh, can expel the material that's around them so that it kind of clears up the neighborhood. Over the next few million years, winds blow the surrounding gas into spectacular swirling patterns. It blows away the gas, it blows away the dust, and it lets us see this beautiful new thing, this place where the star has been born. human lifetime is too short to witness the wonder of a star's birth in the spiral arms. But by speeding up millions of years of cosmic time into just a few seconds, we can see one star born after another. Here and there are even more brilliant flashes of light coming from some of the most violent and dangerous neighborhoods in the entire Milky Way galaxy. Here, stars aren't born. They die. So let's review. Star formation begins with a nebula, a cloud of dust and gas. Gravity causes the nebula to contract or collapse and heat up, and if it gets hot enough, fusion will begin and a star will be born. We call it a protostar, or a baby star. One thing I want to point out by this diagram on the right here is that the star itself is actually that brighter spot in the center. All this disk around the outside is are the leftover materials that did not get incorporated into the star, and these materials are what create solar systems. So yes, the Earth and our other planets and moons, comets and asteroids are all cosmic leftovers, debris that was not incorporated into the Sun when it formed nearly 5 billion years ago. As we continue our discussion of stars, I want you to keep in mind that they exist in a variety of sizes, temperatures, and colors. This diagram shows the major classes of stars, ranging from small red stars to massive blue stars. So you're aware the Sun is classified as a G or a G2 star, making it average temperature and size. So how long do stars live? Well, to answer this, we really only need to know one thing, and that is how big is the star? A star's life cycle depends entirely on mass. So let's take a look at a small star. Okay, Small stars because they don't get as hot, they tend to live long lives with cooler temperatures. Small stars can live for billions upon billions of years, possibly even hundreds of billions of years. The Sun, being an average star, will most likely live for about 10 billion years. Another interesting thing about small stars is that when they come to the end of their lives, they have what I'm referring to as quiet deaths meaning the end of a small star's life is not nearly as explosive and energetic as the end of, say, a large star's life. Now, large stars, because they're so massive and they're so hot, they burn through their energy fairly quickly. So they have short lives, which are generally measured in millions or hundreds of millions of years. I know it sounds like a long time, but compared to billions of years, it's real reasonably short. Like I said, they live their lives at very high temperatures. These massive stars are incredibly hot, and when they come to the end of their lives, amazing things happen. Large stars have very intense, violent deaths. So let's take a look at how the mass of a star determines the life and death of that star. Let's take a look at the stellar evolution, or the life cycle of stars. Again, regardless of size, it all begins with a nebula. Now let's start our little flowchart here by looking at small to average stars. Okay? So once our nebula has contracted and fusion has began, we'll have a protostar and then eventually the star will be in the active part of its life. Now remember we're talking small to average here. 
so like the Sun and smaller. The stars like this will spend most of their lives on what we call the main sequence. This is the main part of their lives where they're actively fusing hydrogen into helium. But the day will come when the hydrogen starts to run out and the fusion of helium begins. And at this point the star becomes much hotter and it actually begins to swell up into what we call a red giant star. Now this is really the beginning of the end for the star. This marks the, the start of the final millions of years of its life. Now when the sun becomes a red giant star, that's going to be a difficult moment because it's going to be so large that it's going to engulf the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, and eventually it's going to reach out to the Earth and vaporize us. So if anyone's around five billion years from now, that'll likely be the end of the Earth. So once the star is swelled to a red giant, it'll reach a point where the fusion is actually going to stop. And at that point, the outer shells of the giant star will be blown off into space. And you'll have what's called a planetary nebula. Now it's called this because ancient astronomers saw these and actually thought they were planets. Now, of course, they couldn't have been further from the correct answer. Um, these are actually simil similar to nebula in that they're massive clouds of dust that was ejected into space when the red giant star ceased fusion. Now eventually the outer shell will drift off into space and you'll be left with just the core which is called a white dwarf. Now it's white because this core remains incredibly hot. These white dwarf stars will essentially sit there in space and cool and eventually the materials will likely be involved in the formation of yet another star. So that's the life of a small to average star but what happens when we have a very large star? So let's look at our high mass stars, much, much, much larger than the sun, thousands of times larger than the sun. Now, as we said, these are going to burn very hot and very quickly. Okay, And as they get to the end of their fairly short lives after maybe a couple hundred million years, they too will swell up as fusion intensifies. They will not become red giants, rather they will become red supergiants which is a good name because they're larger than red giants. They're huge stars. But then something really exciting happens. These red supergiants actually collapse upon themselves and then rebound back into space, causing one of the hugest explosions known to mankind, which we call a supernova explosion. This is the brightest thing in the night sky when we see them. And this, of course, marks the end of a high mass star's life. Now there's two possible things that can be left over after the supernova explodes the guts out into space. The stars that are on the smaller side of the high mass scale, so the, the not quite as high mass stars, will remain as what's called a neutron star. This is a spinning core that's left over. These are incredibly dense and incredibly hot. But what happens to the biggest stars? Well, they collapse and create the densest material known to man, which is a black hole. The reason it's called a black hole is because the material is so dense and the gravity is so strong that everything gets sucked into it, even light. And that marks the end of the highest mass stars. And what you see here is a diagram showing the evolution of stars. And you'll notice they change quite a bit over time, very similar to human lifetimes. You're born, you live, you're a teenager, you're an adult, you get old, and eventually you die. And the same thing is true of stars. But let's specifically look at the sun, because this is our star, and obviously this is most important to us. It's important that we understand where we are now and what's going to happen with the sun. Now we said the sun formed about 5 billion years ago from a nebula. So it's currently in the middle of its life. It's on the main sequence right now. And so it's got about 5 billion years left to go. Essentially 5 billion years of hydrogen left to burn. At the end of that, it's going to swell up into a red giant. It'll explode out as a planetary nebula and then shrink to a white dwarf. And that white dwarf will sit there in space and eventually cool into what we call a black dwarf star. At which point it'll be completely dead. And so that's what we're expecting to happen to the sun. Fortunately, it's still about 5 billion years off. So that's our overview of stars. Thanks for listening.